Now, here's your hosts, The League Dad, Kevin, Mitchell, and Alistair. Uh, hello, welcome to the All In Podcast. We're going to be doing our final episode on MSI 2023. Uh, it's just me and Kevin t- today once again. Scheduling conflicts will forever plague us. Um, but for now, you know, you have to make do with Kevin and Mitchell. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about MSI. So we're, we're going to be talking about everything we didn't cover last episode. So this episode is all the way from BLG versus G2 straight to the finals. Um, it was like six days straight of games. So, um, yeah, how were your overall thoughts and feelings about MSI as a whole? And then we'll kind of tackle through the games as we go forward. So I'm, I'm conflicted. I think that some of the games between the Asian teams were really sick. Like, there were just some incredible levels of play, and it was pretty hype. But I do think that the East-West, like, divide was really on show during MSI, and that kind of made it a little sadder. Like, last year, Worlds was already a disaster, and some part of me was hoping that we would be able to recover this year. Maybe it was a bad meta for us. Honestly, guys, it just looks like the divide looks bigger. Like, if we don't count G2's games, do we? we didn't win a single game in bracket stage against Asia. And G2 only won two over two series, so that's really concerning. Yep, yep. Our one win versus the East is in plans in like a 10 gig, 10k comeback. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty rough when you think about West versus East. Um, the Eastern versus Eastern games, those were fun, I would say. Uh, I think we'll get a little bit into it, but it did feel like Korea kind of, I don't know, a little... They were a little sleep at the wheel. They were a little sleepy uh, when they were playing. Not, not the greatest play that they could have shown, maybe. Uh, and then we ended up getting BLG all the way to the finals. Spoilers. Um, playing against JDG for, I think, the fourth time this year. That's wild. Maybe Fifth fifth best of series, fourth best of five. So they did a best of three in the regular oh season. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> five best of series. That's that's insane. <laughs> I mean, I'll do it again. <laughs> this, this is just crazy. Because that means that, what, JDG has won uh, 4 times 3 is 12, plus another two, 14 times against BLG this year, minimum. Oh, my goodness. Um, Good Lord. Well, let's uh, let's actually, you know, let's talk about that those G2 wins that you mentioned earlier. So, G2 did play against BLG, um, and it was a pretty competitive series. It was actually quite fun to watch. Uh, I think there's a lot of moments, there's a lot of talks that... There are situations where G2 could have won more of these games than just the one they had, and that um, BLG came out after, especially Bin. He said, yeah, they were very competitive. They gave a lot more than we thought they were giving, uh, going to be able to give at least. And I feel like BLG kind of also was playing into G2 and just kind of being total psychos and just playing like crazy, crazy people. Uh, so what are your thoughts about this BLG G2 series? Or you know the one team that always does well internationally for your, for the West. Yeah, so <clears throat> I thought they were pretty competitive as well. I agree. Uh, I think the glaring issue with them was not broken play, which was what I thought would be into Bin. It was actually Caps. Like I honestly think he just played like crap. Not even like this part of the term. I just meant the whole stage, all bracket stage. So first half he was bad. Second half he had some good moments, but it's still for the level we expect him. This guy was like. Going head to head with most of the Asian mids for years, right? So this, it's no longer caps craps, which I mean, we, you see it on Reddit too. It's not caps craps anymore, guys. It's just, just craps crap craps. craps. Like I, craps. I, I, I haven't seen him consi- like for more than like a couple minutes at a time be good, really good for the level we expect. So weirdly enough, it's like, are they going to replace him if he can? T- if he can't survive. The meta changes is still bad. Like it just keeps happening. Do they replace him next year? Yeah, I uh, I don't really know. It's it's hard to say. It's like when you're going around thinking of for at least LCS. It's like, do we replace Bjergsen? Do we replace Double Lift? I don't know. Like what's I mean, there's so much more to lose than just like the potential of how they play, right? You got whole fan bases to think about. You got money to think about. You got the fact that. When these players, they get kicked and leave for another team, they somehow become gods again, you know? Like, so, mm-hmm. um, yeah. I, I would imagine G2 would never really kick Caps unless Caps was also trying to leave too. Um, because he's just, like, the best Western mid laner to, like, ever kind of exist. So, kind of hard to replace that guy, even if he is playing badly. Um, yeah, I have to agree. Caps was 
a big problem for this series and in general um he did kind of innovate the nautilus mid stuff and like a lot of the melee mid stuff but you know what that speaks to me if someone is playing nautilus mid that means like you know sure sometimes they can think it's good but the other way is like they just can't lane they don't care about laning they can't get it done in laning mid lane they can't play any right so they're just like screw it. i'm just gonna play nautilus easy champion point and click um don't have to worry about farming and just focused on macro and roaming right um now that's not to say doinby was bad or anything like that because he was playing nautilus mid but you know we have yagao and caps and other people trying it out and it just makes me think like yeah this is just easy mode so why learn that a lane right um mm-hmm. yeah uh yeah. So, so that's that serious yeah what's going uh, I was going to say, Doinby even said himself afterward, because he was known in 2019 or 2020, the year after, for being a lot better at playing skillful mids, right? And he was just like, yeah, I did have to use those because I wasn't as good. He like, I think he admitted to some extent, I'm paraphrasing, that he wasn't even as good at laning, but then he got way better because he grinded it out. Hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe he shouldn't have done that because he didn't. He didn't, win, he didn't make it out of groups in 2020, so... No, he didn't. They bombed. <laughs> yeah. So maybe mechanics and mid laner are overrated. You should just play Nautilus mid and Rome, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I mean, it was a fun series. It was hype. I do think G2... Man, they... This is the story every year, though. Like, G2 just needed to put together... Put themselves together and contain themselves just a little bit more. And just be a little more disciplined, have slightly, just tiny bit more better mechanics, more better mechanics. Um, <laughs> like, God, they could have done something. Like, I, re- I really felt like even though Caps was like, kind of like the perennial problem maker, like Broken Blade and Han Sama were still making like uncharacteristic mistakes in big fights. Like, I just think about the time where I think Han Sama is on Felios playing against Lucian Nami. And he's getting like gale for- or he's getting um culling by elk, and he wants to get involved into the fight, and he's and he's just like taking the culling, and he gale forces into a Nami wave to try to get involved in the fight, and he just blows up and dies. And it's like that is extreme tunnel vision right there. That that was unfortunate to watch. Um, so all right, enough about this. Enough about this depressing stuff. Let's move on to the next depressing series: Genji versus Cloud Nine. This was the last, last NA hope. The, uh, you know, our final hoorah before they got sent home. And it was not a very, it was not a very happy hoorah. What are your thoughts on uh, Cloud Divers, <laughs> Uh I mean, I'll, I'll keep it shorter this time. Once again, just like we talked about last week, thought Fudge wasn't very good against international top lane. Doran's a much weaker top lane than a lot of the competition, than like Bin they had to, not Bin. Uh, than the other uh, Asian top lanes they have to play into. And then Zen, once again, issues. MS was okay, but, you know, he's not better than Chovy. He's not going to show up if his team isn't good enough either. And uh, Berserker also looked like he just could not play the game, right? Like, the whole team was just outclassed in this series. And it made my opinion of Genji go up quite a bit. So it's unfortunate, but the gap has never looked bigger between NA number one and e, uh, Korea number one, it feels like. Well, at least never since like season three and four. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 Korea number one seed, but it's actually number four team at the MSI, right? There, Genji finished fourth. It was, it's after T1 and BLG, and you know the nice thing about this tournament format is it's hard to argue that placing because Genji played almost everybody except JDG. Same, with, and then T1 did play everyone, right? And then uh, mm-hmm. In the top four, and then BLG played everyone in the top four, right? Genji lost to BLG and T1, so like Genji is pretty clearly the fourth best team at this tournament, and we got 3-0 like lazy shit stomped by Genji. <laughs> 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 like they did not care about this series. You could tell. Honestly, I swear to, I feel like we helped out BLG. We put Genji to sleep because the series was so easy that Genji <laughs> didn't show up against BLG at all. Um, I mean that's that's like. That's the harshest take I could possibly make. But honestly, that's what the series looked like. Like, Cloud9 kind of sort of started coming to life in Game 3, only to, like, I tuned in for, like, a second or something, and it was just, like, a series of ha-has and, like, oopsies from Cloud9 just getting outplayed over and over again. It's like, oh, Blabber getting outplayed, that's not good. Oh, <laughs> Fudge getting outplayed by Doranal, that's not good. Oh, we're just dying randomly over and over again, like... 
Ah, uh, it's so rough. I did watch the Zven interview from Travis um, after the series, and basically Zven was saying, like, yeah, we played, like, total garbage. It sucks. We say this every year, but, like, we had so much more to show. We're, like, we're better than what we, like, delivered on stage. Like, we, we were scrimmed against T1 a lot the night before, so we were confident. And, like, why is it like this every year? It always feels like, yeah, I have to agree, Cloud9 played so much worse than they do against... You know, even in their BLG series, I feel like there was a bit better. Definitely against their Golden Guardian series, like, you know, weaker opponent, but, like, just cleaner mechanics in general. Um, so, bummer for Cloud9. They We got... We, it was just a turbo stomping against, like, the fourth best team at the tournament. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's that. I mean, I think for NA fans, as an LCS podcast, we just have to... Accept that this is our fate and hope that things change. Just like we just need a miracle. I don't think there's so uh, one of our viewers actually, Honrold, he he came up to me and wanted to give out this hot take. It's actually about a week and a half ago, but I just remembered it today. So I'll throw it out now. Um, yeah, why don't like NA teams? I don't know. Try to like sit down, figure out maybe as like a whole region, like how do we progress? Um, as a region and like try to figure something out, have a big old team meeting, right? Like how do we, how do we beat this international problem? And um, yeah, I guess like my quick answer to that, like question or take from Hanrald is um, they, they probably don't know what to do is my, is my first initial guess. They probably don't know how to implement something like that. And then there's too much like domestic competitiveness to ever want to do that too. So um I don't know. Any any quick thoughts or on that sort of take from uh, one of our listeners? Yeah, my thoughts are like I think we need more solidarity as a region. Like even when LPL was like the second best or the best region, like there was always stories about MSIs where all the Chinese teams would come together, even if they're eliminated, and they would just like scrim. They would be like, "Yo, we're gonna help you like beat the Korean team," and then they like win a three two. Right? Imagine if they don't do that. Imagine if they don't share strats. They don't like you know give their best partner, uh, practice partner stuff just for, like, National Pride or whatever, or for League Pride, right? Then they probably will lose 2-3. Like, these are really close games, and you need your best practice. Meanwhile, NA, we're, like, we're fourth. Like, the fifth is really far away from us, but the third, and especially the second, are super far away, too. And for some reason, we're still infighting, we're still bickering, we're still being petty. It, it makes no sense to me. Like, LCS should have more solidarity, because we don't have the room to be cocky or to infight. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's like not a lot of value i think maybe we don't know maybe it's like hard to tell but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of value in winning an lcs trophy right like at least in terms of like determining how good a team is like our best international like our best na team look could like that could be our 10th best na team at world like it would be the same <laughs> like we would just get 3-0 stomps um so it's like <laughs> um <laughs> and from, from that perspective, it's like, yeah, you know, the only way you're going to get better is if the people that you're constantly playing against and screaming against, if they get better and they are like, so they are figuring out your mistakes, right? So if like, let's say you're cloud nine and you're like, you're fudge, right? And you're just the best top laner, suppose, let's just, you know, in this hypothetical world, you're just the best yeah, top laner, yeah. right? In NA. Um, yeah, it's probably in your best interest to help the worst top laner in NA to get better so that when you actually have to play on stage with him and you have to spend time in scrims with this guy, that he's better. So that when you go into international stuff, like, you're not just the best top laner in a sea of trash. Like, so mm -hmm. I, I kind of agree with that. Like, we're at the point where LCS is literally going to die because we're so bad and no one, no one watches us. <laughs> so, yeah, we need to get better as a whole. Like, I don't know. Help the bottom. Um, that's why I miss Core JJ being, like, the best player. Because, like, he would spend all this time, like, having in-houses before uh, Champs Q ever existed and stuff. And um, he did a lot to try to help, like, the general community. He was releasing, like, how to get good on support videos and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure a lot of his, a lot of people watch those videos. Um, so, yeah. I actually do want to bring up, though, now that you mention it, it's actually really sad. Ever since Champs Q's come out, we've gotten worse internationally. <laughs> well, that is kind of true, huh? Yeah, that is you, true. You started this year. This is our second year, and our results are the worst in history. I don't even know how that's possible. Damn. Yeah. 
Wait, yeah, maybe NA solo queue was actually the answer. What the hell? That is true. <laughs> <laughs> we had our two worst showings post Champs queue release, right? Uh, even mm. MSI last year with EG wasn't that great either. So it's like a That's mediocre true. result and two of our worst ever. Um, rough. Real rough. Okay. Um, yeah, so good. <laughs> thanks for the take, Honrald. Led to some interesting conversation about Cloud9 and NA and you know the region as a whole. But we have to move on to more interesting things. Um, so... What was the next series that happened? Um, we had... JDGT1, I believe. JDGT1. Didn't we already have that? Did we talk about that last week? No. We didn't? No. Okay, I'm tripping balls then. Oh. Alrighty. Maybe you're living in the future, but I'm uh, living in the no future. spoilers? Yeah, that's... Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I thought... I swear, I must have talked so much about this uh, game outside this of... This upcoming matchup. Yeah, yeah, that I was just like... Oh my god. Okay, so JDG versus T1... This was a crazy game. Um, oh, last week was Gen G versus T1. I'm trolling. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah, yes. Yeah. There's another Mid- G, yeah. <laughs> Mid podcast. Judgy, judgy. <laughs> judgy, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Anyways, this series was very hype. It was very spicy. One to five games. Um, everyone thought that this was going to be, well, or the finals again, but it was spoilers, it was not. But let's talk about this series in, in a vacuum in itself. Uh, what were your general thoughts and how you felt about the series? Uh, I had a lot of Schadenfreude throughout the series. Uh, as a person who hates the hype every year coming in for every tournament, that T1 is the best team by far. No, what? Like last year, we had bullshit. Like, why are we even competing? T1 is just the best team by far. They mm-hmm. should just get the trophy. Mm-hmm. And I just hear this shit every year. And like, I mean, now the community sentiment has finally started to turn, you know, because it's been what is it, five international tournaments in a row? Four in a row that they haven't won? T1 hasn't won shit internationally since 20, 2016, right? Because 2017, yep. they lost in the finals. Yep. And I I have never heard of a team get so much hype for being number one. This year, it was all LCK, all pro, number one for each player. And I'm sitting here like, what is this shit? Like, how many times do I have to hear this? And I will give them credit. I do watch LCK. They are good domestically. But, like, do we? when do we start doubting them? When do we start saying, like, yo, like... They just can't do it when it matters. And the last thing I'll leave it on before I get into the details is JG versus TY was the uh, the upper bracket final. They, they're screwed. They can't win anything with the word final apparently <laughs> by itself in it. Yeah. it. It's actually magical how this happened. Um, to quickly summarize the series, I thought this was the best series of the tournament. This is the all-time viewership, uh, the highest viewership ever without counting LPL viewership or Chinese viewership. This is the highest ever. It was like 2.3 or 2.4 million. Higher than... RNG versus T1 in the finals last year. So Sheesh. it was a six series, lots of back and forth. Uh, and my biggest things to highlight were Knight popped off. He played really well. Ruler obviously popped off. He played extremely well. And I think 369 was actually my MVP for the series. He, him and the team, their ability to peel was on display in this series more than anything else. And their ability to peel Ruler was on another level. Like, this is a top-class team. It was incredible to see what they were doing. We already mentioned it last uh, week with the Syndra plays. That was crazy. And the things to highlight on the T1 side, Karyo played really well. Owner is not good. Like, <laughs> he's probably a top-three jungler in Korea, but he's not actually that good. Like, he keeps playing badly internationally. His good things, like, he's good at smiting, and he has, like, some good early-game pathing. But, like, he's not that good, guys. Zeus... I actually had a good series. I, I'm not going to lie. Until the worst play of all time, up there with Dignitas versus Renegades at the Herald. Zeus was good until he literally inted as Cannon versus Scion. It was the worst. Or was, oh, was that was BLG. Series, that was versus BLG. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll sorry. I'll leave that there. <laughs> and Faker played badly. Faker yeah. played so, so badly. The, the meme will always be about Faker's mid Nautilus and why is he picking that and all that stuff. But, uh, Spoiler for later, like, other people looked really good on it, guys. I think Faker just needs to figure out what his pool is, because he's still a good player, but it seems like in high-pressure series late, he just he doesn't show up either, and he's the heart, life and soul of the team, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah, he went 0-3 on Nautilus in this series, so um, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty rough. I, I do have to comment, like, in the situations they were picking Nautilus to, um... They were picking Nautilus mid into, like, really difficult stuff. Like, if you just look at game one, right? Okay, first of all, they kept giving 369 Gragas, and that's, like, one of the hardest things to play Nautilus mid into. Because 
Um, it's a full tank Ragus with like a bunch of mobility and damage reduction, right? So if you ever hook the Gragas, you're totally boned because you can't kill that guy. He's mobile. He CCs you. You're, you're toast as the Nautilus. So you can't ever hook the Gragas. That was in like two or three games. Then you throw in there, there's a Wukong, like a Wukong clone. You don't want to hook that. That's doomed. There's a Braum. And you know what? There's only one mid laner in the entire game that can tank a Nautilus hook and still one shot you. And that's Annie because she's got Tibbers. So I felt like, you know, we had three Nautilus games into Annie, and I was like, this is just the worst matchup, man. There's only one mm -hmm. squishy mm -hmm. mage in the entire game that can tank a Nautilus hook with her kit and still one shot your whole team. Like, holy Jesus, it was such a rough matchup. Um, so I really have to blame, like, yo. There's, like, one champion that, like, Knight has been smurfing on all year long, and that is Annie, and you gave it to him three times. Uh, the one time he loses is because he goes proto-belt Borellos for somebody. He's, like, builds, like, a troll build. Like, that's how he loses yeah. on Annie. Like, that's the only way you can beat him, if <laughs> he troll builds. Um, exactly. <clears throat> so I really have to, like, disagree with those draft decisions. I mean, obviously it was intentional, and there's a lot of things that they thought was going to work out for it. But from the viewer's perspective, it's like, you know, we don't know all the little intricacies. We don't know all the little bait strategies that are going on in draft. But to, to the viewers, it just seems so obvious, right? Don't ever give Knight Annie. That just doesn't seem like you want to win. Same with uh, Gragas for 369. It doesn't seem like you want to win. Um, I mean, whatever. That's how it goes. Uh, I, I totally agree with all the... Um, you know, the great stuff that JDG was able to pull, the, the kiting. I mean, we're going to go into it when we get to the JDG BLG series. Like, mm -hmm. these these players are on a different level. They This team feels, it feels like if they can keep this kind of stuff up and they can, like, maybe win worlds and they can just snowball into just an amazing year, this team will be legendary. This team will be forever. Like, people will not forget this team quickly. Um, even this tournament, right? A lot of people, like, don't hold MSI in that regard. Uh, high regard, but I think JDG is still that special that people are going to really remember this tournament and how they were able to perform. Um, so really insane stuff. And then, you know, I guess LPL is insane too because we're going to go to the next series oh. and BLG versus Gen G. I think this was very heavily Gen G favored in terms of just fan opinion and, and audience vote, but this was a fairly one sided series. Uh, what were your thoughts on this BLG Gen G series? I, I was like at a loss for words throughout the series because like yeah you guys will everyone will look it up and see like a 3 0 right and you might think oh yeah dude they got giga stomp but like the actual matches like up until a certain point it always felt like it was pretty close like there was a lot yeah. of back and forth and then blg just always knew how to find winning angles and they were always like better overall also elk giga smurfed like he made pays look like an actual rookie pays is supposed to be the best rookie in the world him and leave from edg pays look bad like, him and Delight specifically, that bot lane combo looked bad. They, the Elk was always just playing like an absolute psychopath. This guy would flash randomly forward. He would just put so much pressure. And I also think that they did a really bad job guarding their bot lane and playing around their bot lane. It looks like the Korean teams did poorly in general for that. The last notes I have were the Chobi and Dorn just looked they look outclassed, which is weird, because one of those... Like, Ben winning? Sure, makes sense. Yagao? What is this guy made of? Why does he have the ability to play against... He got so, like, destroyed by Miru in play-ins, and then he just looks good or fine against Chovy. Like, can someone explain this guy to me? What is he... Like, he plays against Knight all the time and looks fine. He plays against Faker, he looks fine. What is he doing? Does he just only play to the level of his opponent no matter what? I Yeah, Yagao is a weird one. I mean, Yagao has also, like, I feel like it was a bit of the power of anime that was, like, fueling Yagao. He had to get to the finals to face Knight, to face his former team. <laughs> like, uh, like he, he had to go face JDG again, like, the team that kicked him for basically, like, his brother in arms, right? For base for Knight. Um, if you guys don't know the story between Knight and Yagao, you guys should definitely look it up, find it out somehow. I don't know. I think there's a bunch of Reddit threads on it. But basically... There's a bunch of Reddit threads, yeah. Yeah, they're from the same city... There are, like, pseudo-brothers that, like, grinded and played League as little kids against each other. And then they, they like, promised each other they were going to, like, make it big in League and freaking climb to the top. They went through, like, Chinese amateur, got picked up by random teens, and would just play against each other over and over again in the finals of LPL. 
And you know what? Neither of them ever did anything interesting internationally until recently. But they always were fighting against themselves against each other in the finals of LPL and taking it to five games and like beating each other up. And then now, like I think this is the first time in a while where like Yagao is not on top. Yagao is usually on think on the winning team because he was on JDG. <clears throat> yep. But there's Knight, a winning record at least. Yeah, Knight takes a spot from on JDG. And beats him with it. So um, we'll talk a bit more of that storyline when we get to the finals. But this is where the storyline kind of starts, I guess. Because, yeah, Yagao is freaking invincible against Korean mid laners. And it just runs it down against Knight <laughs> in the finals. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he played a very good series. Like, I mean, all of BLG, I feel like they were just playing super well mechanically. And it was, yeah, I agree. It was up to, like... Uh, Doran and a little bit of Peanut, Chovy, and I guess the whole team, right? And Pays, right? They were just making... I, I basically listed the whole team. They were just making mechanical mistakes, <laughs> like in team fights and play... Like, it was weird. Um, definitely felt like they were a bit sleepy after their C9 game. Like, it's just not clean play. It's just not clean mechanics at all. Like, that was their main problem, too. It's hard to comment on the macro or the draft at all when, like, mm -hmm. you know, you just fumble a play, like, really badly. Um... Especially Chovy, man. Like, God, there was a time. It was game three, right? Um, and mm -hmm. this was a game that was like really back and forth, but BLG was obviously still like ahead and very strong. And like, uh, on he flashes in to to get a hook, and he misses the hook, and then Chovy is like an inch away from him and flashes onto the Blitzcrank and ulti. I was like, no, Chovy, you just flashed an inch <laughs> away to to to, to kill a, the Blitzcrank, and then they lose the fight after. And I'm like, dude, no, Chovy, that's that was like that could have been it. That could have been a huge play for you if you just flashed onto the like the Lorenz to the enemy team. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This series was weird. I will say, Elk Gaming though, there was that one fight around the Baron. Elk had the insane jinx spacing that we've seen a couple times this tournament. Oh my god. Oh my god, dude. Pays was tilted. He was just trying to run back and auto him. He runs way too far forward. Because he's, he's right clicking onto the Jinx and Jinx kites his ass. And then, yeah, that was, it was pretty insane. That was beautiful. That dude. was pretty beautiful I, from Elk. Yeah. That was some good stuff. All right. Well, this was a series for sure. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to the next BLG series in the BLG anime story. Um, it was BLG versus T1. I think this was even more one sided in terms of fan opinion than BLG versus Gen G. I think everyone. Thought T1 was gonna win this. I thought T1 was gonna win this. I was iffy on Gen G versus BLG, but definitely I was like, I mean, T1 took JG to five games. BLG can't even do that, right? Uh, but once again, someone's sleepy at the wheel. What's going on? Uh, so let's talk about this JDG or Gen G. What is this here? BLG versus T1 series. There it is. <laughs> yeah, we thought it was gonna be Gen G T1. I know. Yeah, I know it's hard yeah, to yeah, believe yeah. what the reality is. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, to get into the series, well, the previous series was the first 3 0 by a Chinese team and a Korean team since, like, OMG versus Naji and White Shield 2014 or some shit like that. Like, it's been forever. Yeah. So that was crazy. And then this series was even crazier because T1 is supposed to be the team that is willing to skirmish with you. Like, Genji is the perfect macro team, allegedly, right? That's their style. They have the best setups, blah, blah, blah. But T1's the more scrappier style. They have better hands than Genji across the board, except for Chobi, probably. And so they're supposed to be able to take the fight, right? They're supposed to have the best support, what maybe the best player in the world in Karia. They have all these like people with hands like Zeus, who's supposed to be the top best top laner. Guma is top two, top three AD carry, right? So they're supposed to take it to BLG. And what's crazy about the series is like two two things really stuck out to me. One, Nautilus was like the problem, right? You got just like completely smurfed on uh, Nautilus. Like he just played it correctly and destroyed T1 with it. So that excuse goes out the window. And then Kindra was another problem that everyone was pointing out for the Korean teams and making excuses for. And then Shun just picks Kindra. He only won one of two games, but he looked effective on it. He actually looked like he knew what he was doing. And one thing I think you give credit for BLG is that they can really bring the fight to you. They just like make really good teams look bad because they pressure you all the time. And they just keep flipping. So like a typical BLG game is both teams are 15 and 15, but BLG is 2k ahead and they're starting to win. Because for some reason you just get out. They know how to macro while being really crazy, which is kind of incredible. And then the last thing to highlight was what I mentioned before. Zeus made the worst play of all time in oh, pro play at an international yeah. tournament. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, if you watch it back, like you'll, all you have to do is look up Zeus versus Bin 
<laughs> terrible play, Kennen or something. He like Comey just walks under a charging Scion Q, throws his stun uh, Q, which he had a powered auto in his stun Q, so he was trying to do an instant stun to screw over Bin, and then he screwed it up, and he just got solo kill, and Bin's like full health. <laughs> and this is under tower against a fully charged Scion Q. So it was the worst plays I've ever seen. And what I wanted to highlight as a talking point is, is Zeus just not it? Like, is he just probably one of the best players possible in top lane, but he just will never show up internationally? Because if that's the case, do you replace him? And can you replace him? Can you afford to? Who would you replace him with? Like, I can only think of Keen as a better player. Or, yeah. like, a side grade, right? But maybe not a tilter in finals. So, once again, lower bracket finals. T1 got smacked. It was a 3-1, but honestly, BLG looked like, in Game 4, even when they were behind, it looked like they would always win. Like, it always looked like BLG had the right idea on how to win a game, and T1 looked completely lost. And we didn't even mention Faker, but Faker, outside of Cassante gameplay, his Lissandro was atrocious. His Lissandro was completely useless. He kept self-alting so many times, he had, like, one really good ult, and then the rest were just dog. And then his Jace was also useless. His Cassante was amazing, and his Ari, which is one of his signature picks, was also very average. He he got completely schooled by Yagawa's friggin' Nautilus. Yeah, yeah. I you know the Cassante mid was good. He also beat they also beat JDG with it. it doesn't seem like they ever visit yeah. the same things that they beat people with. They just, well, they, it's usually perma banned, so that's why. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. It's. Uh, you can kind of orchestrate your bands though to kind of make it work to kind of get the Cassante, but they, you know, they only did it twice the whole tournament. It felt like, and they won both team times against the LPL teams, but not enough from the T1 team, not enough meta read. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen some interviews floating around. Zeus kind of talked about his own play uh, and how he really butchered that one, and it sounds like he just like lined up a queue of decisions, but didn't like notice what was happening in his face right in front of him. So mm -hmm. once more, a bit of a tunnel vision effect. Uh, yeah, I would say it is probably from a high level team and a high level player the absolute worst play that's ever happened. Like it just looks like he's AFK. Uh, <laughs> it looks. I, I think a lot of people commented like <laughs> like it's like sophisticated win trading. I'm like that's not sophisticated win trading. That is. That is straight up griefing, bro. Like, like if that Dude, happened, if in I my... did that, I would get a seven day ban for <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yo, the bounce would already be gone, man. The bounce of SS, he's gone. He's in another, he's in another <laughs> fucking server. Like, yeah, he is banned to the shadow realm for that play. It was bad. It was really rough. It was confusing. It was. It had all sorts of weird feelings around it. Um, mm -hmm. I also got a comment. Uh, Caria, he got three games of recon. And I don't know how many times he W'd into a wall, but it was more than twice. And that's just too many times. It doesn't matter how many more after that. It's just there's too many times to W right into a wall as Recon. A lot of weird, just weird mechanics, man, for the, the whole series. Um, that was definitely the, just, I don't know, the confusing point. Why I keep saying they're sleepy, right? Uh, yeah, what, what's up, Kevin? Yeah, keep, keep it going. <laughs> yeah. I, w I want the T1 fans to just, like, stop hyping their team to, like, Heat Kingdom Cup. They're a good team, guys. They yeah. consistently, like, a same roster, placing this high over and over is amazing. And T1 is a historic org. You should respect them. Like, as for me, I'm a fan of the org, but I really don't... Or, I'm a fan of the players on this team and of the org historically, but recently it's just really hard to support them. Like, I keep hearing hyperbole, like, Caria doesn't make mistakes. Or Caria is just the best. I'm like, are we watching the same games? Like, even before the series. Like, he makes he's a normal player, but... He's a normal human like everyone else, but he is a very high-level player, right? Because at a high level, when you're both good, you make more mistakes because you force each other. And so I just don't get it. Like, everyone just gets hyped to Kingdom Come, and it's just so obnoxious to watch as a viewer. Because, like, even the casters, when I was watching LCA Finals, the whole time, uh, whenever they're, like, doing poorly or whatever, like, when they're losing to Gen.G, they're just like, oh, this like, how could this possibly be happening? It's like, this kind of narrative is going on. And it's just very obnoxious. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is BLG comprehensively smashed bot lane like four games in a row. And owner just physically could not process through his brain and the coaching team couldn't teach him between matches to go bot, to play in path toward bot. Do you know how many dives that just happened at level three or two over and over in the same spot at the same time? It was actually so incredibly bad by the whole team of T1 that yeah. they could not 
figure out the game plan. Like, Bale's just like, we'll fucking do it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's... Honestly, it feels a lot like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Yeah, they, like... Dude, Clash teams don't even fall for that in more than one game in a row. Like, what is this? Yeah, I don't know. I That, that was interesting um, that... Yeah, I don't know. T1 just was very stubborn this series, too, it felt like, as well. They just kept... I don't know. Like, I guess maybe Z it got to Zeus's head, right? Everyone was saying that he was mm -hmm. playing tanks only in the Gen G series, and he's like, no, I can play carries. <laughs> I will play carries, and you know what? My jungler's gonna camp my ass, and we're gonna win through top lane. We're gonna beat Bin. Bin is the win con of BLG. We have to beat him. But, dude, Bin... He doesn't give a crap, dude. He'll, he'll like he'll just absorb it all, and he'll just show up, and he'll be even or ahead still. Like, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it felt like T1. It, it honestly, it looked like because they were playing towards bot lane in other series, kind of right, and they're playing towards mid a yeah. lot, and they're playing to unlock the mid laner and bring them down bot lane. Um, yeah, it felt like they pivoted last minute stylistically against BLG uh, to no avail. Like it just. It, it, it was something they hadn't practiced enough, or it's just something that wasn't good enough in the meta to try out, and they just were stubborn. And, you know, yeah, I think it's pretty funny that, like, they got beaten by the picks that they, they were saying or coping, the fans were coping, that were bad against JDG. Like, oh you mentioned the Kindred and the Nautilus, but there's also the Galio as well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, BLG, they got three Zeri Lulu games. God damn it, dude. It's freaking back. Like, it is... <laughs> I hate like, it. Like, we were all, like... Hyping up how, like, oh, the draft's so interesting. You know, we got Kha'Zix, we got Nidalee, we have all these cool new picks. And, you know, here I was being lame and, and doom and gloom and like, I think we're just going to go back to the same drafts, right? Maokai, Sejuani, Wukong, you know, Vi is obviously going to be there. And then, yeah, we're going to get Zeri, Lulu, Lushinami. And guess what? That's what we freaking get. Lushin is banned on blue side. We do get a Lushinami early in other parts of the series. We're getting Zeri, Lulu. We got Sejuani, Maokai. Like, it all came back. Uh, Wukong was obviously an insane pick too. Like, it's crazy that it all came back once we actually got to the to the the games that mattered, right? Um, the the tournament live games. So um, yeah, yeah. I I just think it's funny that that's how things worked out. Um, T1, yeah, mechanics, man. That was their big problem. Uh, their just initial first pathing from the jungler and just overall game plan. I mean, it was confusing. Maybe it could have worked, but. Hard to say when you keep boofing all your mechanics, you know. Uh, I think you you made a lot of good points about T1 so far, so I'll just say that they are a good team. Like, God, don't let it, like, the players, right? Okay, so sure, we can do different things as fans, but the players, like, get out of your own head. Stop, like, inflating your own ego and then playing like crap after, right? Like, whatever that combination of line that, like, happens, stop doing that. Because you guys, like, you don't deserve a huge ego. You deserve to be humble, at least as a second-place team, mm -hmm. right? Because you haven't won anything. So mm -hmm. I think, like, they have what it takes to win, but will they ever? We will find out, I guess, in the future, in the I next episode. It. I think it's too much now. I don't think... I think they've lost enough times that it's actually a mental block. Because it's yeah. just a collective thing. They go into any big series, apparently even upper bracket and lower bracket finals count now, too. Yep. And they just can't. They. I actually don't think T1 is worse than BLG. I think BLG should lose to T1 on most days. I think that the Korean teams came in, they got absolutely blindsided, and they just, like, group tilted. Like, they saw Gen Z get 3-0, and they're like, if we lose like that, we're gonna get, like, a fucking truck fleet outside of our headquarters. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's too much, like, outside pressure for these players and their mentalities, yeah. right? It does feel like LPL, like, maybe it was different for IG back in 2018, and they choked themselves to death and lost to TL, I don't know. But, like, most LPL teams, I found, like... They're just fine. Like, they don't feel like they, they mentally tilt. Like, they lose, it's just because they're worse. It doesn't feel like they're, like, mental booming or anything, right? They just play mm -hmm. dying. They try, die trying. Like, that's their, like, kind of vibe I get from most LPL teams. So, weird stuff from LCK. You know, you guys got to chill with, with the mental stuff. Um, yeah, you know. Stop pressuring them. Don't read social media. Don't look out the window at the trucks, and you'll be fine. You, <laughs> Don't look out good. the window <laughs> at the trucks. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Dude, you know, Ben was down like 60 CS in that Scion Cannon game, and he got the solo kill because he just said, like, I'll do my job. And then you screw up. Like, I mean, I'm untiltable, apparently. Yeah. I, I got to say, just a very quick comment, dude. I feel like, I swear to God, dude, CS leads against tanks, like, literally don't matter. Like, you could be 100 Especially CS on Scion. 
like oh my god it does not <laughs> matter bro like <laughs> like just don't even bother going up there honestly as kenan don't even bother getting the cs lead like you got a roam or something like i swear like mm -hmm. we'll get to jdg versus blg like it B bin was like the one guy doing anything and he could not impact the game until it was way too late. Like, that's what it felt like. We'll move on and talk about JDG versus BLG now. But it was a JDG 3-1. And yeah, Bin was the star player for sure for BLG. He was playing a carry. But it's just 369 playing a tank saying, I don't care. I'll go down a million CS. And I will be <laughs> fine. We'll be fine. I'll just, you know, I, I won't take up any resources. I'll show up in team fights with CC and taking this. And we'll win uh, through that. But, I mean... Bin played well, super well, but top lane, man, he, he's just sitting up there with a huge CS lead, a bunch of plates, a bunch of pressure. Doesn't matter. Doesn't do anything. Not enough. Um, so, yeah. That, what, what are your overall thoughts on the series? And then we can get a little bit more into the nitty gritty after. Yeah, my overall thoughts on the series is that I think this is why the double elimination format exists. If this was a single elim format, we would have just got... JDG 3-0ing BLG and everyone thinking BLG's crap. That's it. That's literally that that's the world we would have lived in. And because we got to see BLG do that 6-1 run against Korea, like it was so much more interesting when they got to the finals. They still got smacked, guys. It was a 3-1, but like it looks like JDG just has BLG's number. Like they just cannot care less. And I think 369 looks like he just has out like Ben might be the second best top laner in LPL or Ali or somebody like that, one of the top top laners there. But 369 is on another level. Like, this guy just should rename himself to 999. I've never seen a man <laughs> who just, like, is untiltable. He can play against carry. He can just, he gets the worst draft priority in, like, at least over half of his games. Okay. He just, give me whatever, guys. I'll play whatever and I'll do good stuff with it. Like, Gragas is obviously a good pick and a high priority, but he was just allowed to have it. And he found the best flanks in the world. Like, I have never seen someone avoid Korean vision games so many times in a row and just flank Guma, flank Elk. Like, he just was always up in their business. Uh, he's good on carries. You saw him, like, hyper-carry last year at JDG on Aatrox, right? And this year, yeah, he was mostly on Saiyan duty and Gragas duty, but, like, does he, he was just playing so effectively on them. I think this guy is the real deal for two years now, or at least a year and a half now, and I, I think he should be the best top laner, at least internationally, right? Like, when it matters, he's the best. Besides that, uh, I think this was Knight's coming, like, of, like the culmination of everything, right? What it really mattered, he, he hyper-carried in some of these games. Like, Ruler was good. Knight was, he made Korean Jace a meme. Like, you know how we used to say Korean Jace is way better than NA Jace? Dude, people were, make, <clears throat> people were blaming Jace for the Faker loss, and then Knight picked it three games in a row and made it look like it was absolutely turbo-broken. Oh, yeah. He was stopping not just the mid lane, he was stopping everyone across yeah. the map. It was absurd. His Annie was kind of a bad game, but his uh, his Jace was incredible. And he had a good Annie game earlier in the tournament, right? A couple of them against T1. So yep. I think Knight's the real deal, too. I don't know if he's number one. I still think Chovy showed a better form during regular season compared to Knight. But like at this tournament, Knight was obviously the number one mid laner, right? So yeah, for sure. uh, we didn't get to the bot lane, which is an all-star bot lane, too. Like, I... Uh, this team is absurd. I feel bad for BLG, but at least they got to show their chops against the teams that matter. There is an alternate universe where Gen.G or Team was to BLG and made it to the finals, and JDG could lose on the day. We don't know, but yep. this is the tournament we got, and JDG did play everyone besides Gen.G, yep. and they look good. So, kudos to them. Kudos for Knight finally getting his international win, a second one, technically. He won MSC, but that's like a regional win. They beat Korea 3-0 in the finals as well. But most people don't count that because they didn't watch it because COVID. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, I gotta <laughs> say this. Uh, the series was pretty. I would say narratively wise, it was very interesting. It was pretty crazy, and it was you know out of the beauty of this format, as you're mentioning, right? Uh, everyone would have thought BLG was bad, fourth best team. Uh, at the tournaments, if they got 3-0'd by JDG, life goes on, c'est la vie, right? But no, BLG really proved themselves. They did they did the dirty work. They freaking went all the way through the lower bracket to make it to this finals and proved that they were the second best team. And that LPL is the king of MSI. Like, LPL owns MSI. This is their freaking tournament. Uh, and it yeah, has been for years. Uh, like, yeah, one... 
One LPL seed wins the whole thing. Two LPL seeds, yeah, you're top two. You beat everybody else. Uh, pretty nuts stuff from this region. <clears throat> we'll see if they can do anything at Worlds this year because, uh, you know, it's a bit shakier at Worlds usually. It's kind of tradition at this point. I think they handshake MSI and Worlds. <laughs> yeah, I don't. It's, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, we'll see how things shake out. But for sure, I mean, this series, Jace had 100% win rate. Was interesting because for the entire tournament, Jace was not a prio pick and had a pretty poor win rate. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was kept being played mid. We didn't see a single Jace top on. Maybe we saw one or two here and there, but in terms of high profile teams, I don't think we saw a single Jace top. Super weird. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know why. I don't know what's going on with these in these players' minds. What's going on in scrims to make that happen? Um, but you know, I think a lot of us were saying that like before the tournament even started, that Jace was going to be a high prio pick because you know it was a regular season, didn't get nerfed, right? It feels like it's just a strong pick in general for pro play. Very flexible and just insane lane dominance and damage. And it was just not prioed at all until essentially the finals. Weird how that happens sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> but that's how it goes. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the junglers were Sejuani, Maokai, and Wukong. So Wukong. <laughs> we got a freaking... And then we also uh... have to comment. We got a first-time Nautilus jungle from Kanavi. Not as in, like, oh, this is yes. the first time that Nautilus jungle has ever been played. It's been played years and years ago. But Kanavi said himself he had never played a goddamn <laughs> game of Nautilus jungle in his life. And they pick it in the finals in game one and flex it. And they're saying, yes, this is a this is a three-way flex. This is not a two-way. It's three flex. Like, I mean, you got to tell me something's wrong with a champion if you can do that, right? Like, isn't that a little too broken that this champion yeah. who can barely clear can just be thrown into the jungle because his hook and his CC is so broken that you can just put him in any role and you can just first time him, right? Like, I, I don't know. That just seems um. I mean, it, it fundamentally, the clear is not hard and then the mechanics aren't that difficult either. So I get someone like Kanavi being able to play it. I will say as a novice jungler player myself in like season four, like he hasn't been played in pro play since I think they said X-Smithy in 2016 or 15, like a long time ago. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I was really happy to see it. I thought Kanavi like picked in the right spot because traditionally, I think some people may have mentioned it on some podcasts, but... It, Nautilus is a good matchup with the Maokai. Like, they do very similar things, and Nautilus can just be as effective or more in certain situations. Yep. And I think that, like, people gaslighting and saying that Nautilus is bad, it's just, like, for some reason, some of the Korean players just can't play Nautilus. Like, I think Nautilus has almost always been an LPL pick. Like, Ming is famous for his. Like, Going B is famous for his. Like, they just know how to play Nautilus and know how to use the engage button. They know how to smurf with it. I don't know why. I don't know why they decided to flex it to jungle. They never used it in the rest of the draft. For the rest of the friggin' series, so it felt like they were just trying to mentally break JD or BLG. BLG yeah, like he doesn't yeah. play Nautilus, and it worked. It was just, it was literally just like a freaking <laughs> just YOLO ego. I don't like they they freaking JDG banned <laughs> Nautilus game two after that, and they lose that one. Like Nautilus was like a, the weird just anti curse. I don't get it. <laughs> it's such a weird series, man. Such a weird <laughs> tournament. Weird ass tournament. This this tournament was so weird, man. Um, Nautilus, I I gotta say, like he has been nerfed and buffed and changed so many times, and he has always been pro relevant. Like. There was a time where Nautilus was memed as being picked in pro play as like just an auto int champion because he was so squishy because he'd been nerfed so many times that's like oh I wonder how many times Nautilus will die this game right there was a there's a little bit of counter that people meme on yeah but he's just so good I honestly think like the point and click ulti and the hook bullshit like the crazy hitbox I think it needs changes and, and works because like this tournament really showed that like Nautilus is not even like stat wise like just raw numbers a good champion even in this tournament but his kit is so broken that it doesn't matter because you just click r on people and he's abusing items like evan shroud and abyssal mass with, with uh percent damage uh increases and stuff like that so i i, I think mean, we didn't mention it but faker lost his team the whole series by hooking in game five at baron that was also another iconic terrible play yeah, yeah. There's all these like bad things you can do on Nautilus, but like, um, I don't oh. know. Weird pick. Just a weird pick in general. Might need some changes in the future. I don't know. There, it's a lot of interac interactivity, right? Like uninteractivity. Like that's why I complain about Gragas and Vi. Yeah, it's too mm -hmm. easy to just click people, right? Uh, and then have them not be able to move. But anyways, that was a little tangent. Let's talk more about this series. Um, yeah. 
yeah, the the JDG they really flexed their bot lane prowess, right? They played every basically bot lane available: Jinx, Zaya, Zeri, Aphelios. That was all the meta ADCs in this tournament. Uh, we got a first time. Oh my god, dude. Okay, so BLG and JDG, they go 1-1 versus each other, right? Super hype, yep. back and forth series. Everyone's thinking this is going to go the distance. This is going to be a banger series. And then you get to <laughs> game three, we get the vein lock in. The whole audience is, <laughs> is, is going crazy. People are losing their minds. People are typing up a Reddit storm on their freaking little keyboards. And um, you get you're they're in the river. It's uh it's uh elk and uh, missing. They're like emoting the we emotes in the river before the oh game. Oh my god, that's a little so bit funny. of respect, a little bit of love. On on the other side, he's on Lulu. He freaking he's like get off my ADC. He gets a little spelthy sprock <laughs> to annoy him back. And then uh, I mean just like it's just like the most stompy series ever. Like BLG just gets completely annihilated with the ego pick. Um. I gotta say, man, that was rough to watch. That was like, I felt like we were having this really sick back and forth series where maybe mm -hmm. BLG finally is here and can do something. The ego pick Vayne into complete mental boom. Just utter annihilation in game three and game four. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's okay, BLG. It, it was still pretty fun <laughs> to watch. <laughs> it was pretty hype. I think it was pretty doomed for you um, from the get-go. But, uh, I mean, like, I just love to look at these drafts, right? It's like, 369 Kanavi on the tank duty when they're so often playing carries against BLG, who's essentially picking four or five carries every game. Um, yeah. So pretty wild stuff. Any final thoughts on the series you want to go over? It was yeah. It was a fun time. Yeah, it was a fun time. I will say the viewership was relatively low, but it's just because there's no popular T1 in the finals, which is usually the case, uh, or popular Korea inter-region war, and we've already seen this. So the viewership was pretty low, but, you know... It, all the narratives and the history of, of LPL versus LPL finals, like we've just never had something like that, right? Um, yeah. So it was cool as in that front. The context between the W emotes, if you guys don't know, Elk used to actually lane with On. Um, not Elk, sorry. Um, Elk used to lane with Missing on WE yeah. there it is. in the past. And uh, I believe Elk was the one who was going to quit, but Missing convinced him not to, um, or maybe vice versa. So like they were just like on W on like pretty mid to bad teams for a long time, and one of them was going to quit, and now they're both like popping off. Like Elk was probably the second most impressive AD carry at the tournament, or the most impressive, depending on how much you weight his wins against Korea. Right? This guy was like being memed on for being Jackie Love poop oil, but like people forget Jackie Love is a monster when he's on, and Elk looked like he was better than Pace, and at least him and his support and his team were better than Gumiyushi Karia, which is incredible, right? So even though I do think Ruler Missing had the edge this series, I think it's just because their team is so incredible at setting them up. Yeah. Like, all the bot lane meme dives that Shrim was getting for free against the Korean team just almost never manifested. Like, it was always close, if, even if they did go for it. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, we're gonna continue on the on the ruler hype train because I don't think I we we did enough fanboying yet uh, oh, in this sure. episode at least <laughs> maybe in other episodes we have. But um, one <laughs> thing that actually blew my mind about uh, ruler the series was he did a play I've never seen in my goddamn life, um, it, and it's something I'd never even think of doing because uh, it's a very specific play. But it's uh, he's playing Jinx uh, against Maokai jungle. And he's going into the Rift Herald. This is around like maybe like 10, 12 minutes, something like that. I don't know. Um, maybe second Rift. I don't remember. It was pretty early, pre-20 minutes, going to Rift Herald. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a classic. This happens. This will happen in your solo queue game, right? You're against the Maokai jungle. He is set up at the Rift Herald. He's got his saplings. He's sitting in the bush. And he's waiting for you to face check into him so that his team can engage on you and they can wipe mm -hmm. you, right? Classic. Happened a bajillion times. I'm sure Ruler has played against it a million times. Maokai jungle sitting in the river waiting to gank you at the Rift Herald. And what mm -hmm. Ruler does is he face checks that ass. And then he gets flash W'd by Maokai, and he perfect cleanses it, and he walks and he dodges oh, the yeah. Maokai Q, and completely screws over all of BLG and kites them. Like, that is one of those plays that's like, you know, it's the ultimate counterplay, okay? Because I think a lot of people, when they see a Maokai sitting in the Rift Herald in River in Fog of War, like, they, they think of a different play. Like, they let their tank face check, right? And then they let the mm -hmm. ADC kind of, like, come in later. Or they go through a different angle, right? Maybe they go through the mid wave, or they go through the top side. But Ruler does the ultimate counterplay in that 
I will bait you into flash ulting me. I will only use my cleanse and not flash, and I will win the team fight single handedly by mm-hmm. playing it perfectly mechanically. Like that's only something you could do if you're ruler or if you're like have perfect mechanics and you have the perfect play. So that that kind of like next level decision making. That's like it's like I don't know, man. Like people would never think to do that because you have to execute it mechanically perfect. Otherwise, it's a play that goes badly. Yeah. Ruler could die there and throw the game there if he doesn't play it mechanically perfectly. So, um, yeah, that's that's just really insane, man. That's that's not that's not normal. <laughs> you can't. He that is not normal. That. <laughs> you <should check> the <laughs> that's PC. not normal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I that kind of play, like even if there are eighty carries, there's maybe like a handful of eighty carries with the hands to do that play. To have the thought process to do that play and the trust in your team and the coordination, whatever he had to do. Maybe they just reacted. Maybe it was a mistake, but I'm pretty sure it was intentional based on what it looked like. The class oh, was, was just too clean, yeah. right? It's yeah, that yeah. had to be intentional. And the only thing that that reminded me of is like, I feel like the only time I've ever seen something similar was Uzi when he, in his prime where he would like E4 on Ezreal, right? And we're like, what is he doing? And then he would just like flashback, perfect cleanse, flashback and bait the enemy team. And he would basically initiate his AD carry. Him, yep. Jack Love, like a couple legendary eighty carries in history have done plays like this, but you have to understand that the play against that Maokai as uh was it Jinx or was it? Yeah, he was, I forgot he was, what he played. He was playing Jinx, yeah, ruler, yeah. Yeah. It or was it Sari? Well, I think it was Jinx. And that kind of play is so much harder to do when you don't have a, a an E four. <laughs> like that character has issues that like it's just not mobile enough, right? So he did that on the nice edge and basically just won his team like all the momentum impossible. I think that was game one. Yeah, it was so game one. Yeah. He, yeah. He's incredible. I think his play style, I think it's hard to know because it's hard to notice if you have only been watching LPL recently, but like from his Korea days to his LPL days, I feel like he's evolved to another level of like the aggression that he wasn't. He was the best cleanup AD carry possible in the world for so long, but I think he's gotten another level of like lane prowess, aggression, and like playmaking. That he wasn't always showing on Gen G because I think he didn't have the room to do it. I think honestly on Gen G with the Doran on your team, you had to like be the insurance policy. You couldn't just be the playmaker. Yeah, I mean you got Knight and three six nine and Kanavi all behind you to like pick up the slack, right? So yep. yeah, he's playing so aggressively. He's playing so on the knife's edge. Like it's it's the kind of ADC play that's like I don't know. It's just like. I don't know. It, it, it's hard to put in words. It's indescribable. I don't think most players, unless you're like a very select few of handful of players, you actually you can actually truly comment and know what's going on with Ruler and what he's doing, mm-hmm. right? I don't care if you're yep. like what if you're the most if the co streamer with the most views in the whole world, like holy cow, like you have no idea what this guy's doing. Like he's clearly on another level. It, like the I cannot just I cannot fathom that kind of bait play that, that he did. Like just, he just totally screwed over a freaking Zune, dude. It's <laughs> like Zune was like, so just, boomed. It, <laughs> it's the kind of play that like inspires a whole generation. Like not just that play, but like that level of play and that level of forethought inspires like a whole generation of players in the future to try to copy and solo queue. It's like you know how shit like Lisa and Insect Kicks become just like a gold thing that people do. But like yep. those huge plays, like when Double made his huge play on. Lucian, right? Uh, stuff like that it just inspires a whole generation of players to like try to do that kind of shit, try to elevate their level, right? Like expect yeah. more. Like a lot of the shit you see in season three through six would look like pedestrian. It looks like shit we see in like LCS, like yeah. mid tier <laughs> LCS teams can do it now, right? So yeah. ruler doing that is like shit you'll see like five, ten years from now. You're like, oh yeah, it's the AD carry bay or whatever. But like, it's incredible that he has that forethought and the hands for it these days. Yep, it is absolutely insanity, and it's something that you can only do if you got, you know, essentially the two best regions ever to exist just battling out against each other for 10 years straight, right? This is like peak performance. This is the result of that, and it's, it's really hard, you know, for us NA plebs to ever recreate something ridiculous like that. Like, Jesus Christ, man. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do we got anything else to talk about this series? Because we've we have really just I don't know been blown away. I think by some of the play that we can get. That's possible. Uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention is like I do think Carrie is still number one, but I think On and Missing and Ming and uh, Mako at times to, this year Mako like these guys are still really good. Like I I think yeah. they're very unsung because they no one's highlighting them as like the MVPs and in these matches, but. These guys are playing incredibly. They were playing some against some really good support talent on the other ends. 
and they just like had great dives, great setups. The own on his Lulu, maybe not in the finals, but like everywhere else, he was roaming around just aggro everywhere. Like you just always see a, a Lulu running at you. Like who does that? Like, Dude, he's, it does more damage. I swear, his Lulu <laughs> does more damage than mine. <laughs> like what, it's I don't actually know. crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. There was yeah. like this one time delight, or it was a carry. Got a double kill on Rakan in the in a fight near uh, Blue Side Jungle near the mid turret. And he was, they were like, oh, is he going to get a triple kill? And then Lulu just, like, randomly smacks Rakan. I was oh, like, I remember, yeah. where, did that, where did level 7 Lulu get that damage on level 9 Rakan? What, what the hell? Like, obviously, yeah. it was a very simple combo, but he just, like, is always playing, or almost always playing at a super high level. I just think, one, they have On, especially, is a terrible name for a pro player. And mm. all, the, all you get is, like, off. cheat me of On off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's good for cheap memes, but, like, it's just not a memorable name. But I feel like these guys are like in that like 1.5 tier like right below carry and they could be up there i mean they showed up when it mattered so you know there's that <laughs> yeah i i think for carry i mean he he is s tier if he's not like running it down like he his last games and last series was just him on rakan just like wing into walls man like man it is oh rough like it, it, it is just about like consistency carry has it all like in the one moment that it matters, every other support seems to have it over him, and that's just that's just that's just rough because people will remember that one moment more than it. Like Barrel, right? Oh my God, look, think of last year Barrel, the least consistent guy, one of the worst <laughs> mechanics you could possibly imagine Dude, in the best memer, support ever. He runs it all the time. He's a maximum memer, but you know what? It doesn't matter because it, he's at Worlds and he's just barely enough, and he wins the thing. And, the, you know, you, he's running it down all year long. Kerry is trying his best to be consistent, the number one, all year long. But, you know, one one goofy Heimerdinger boy, and he wins the whole thing, right? So, yep, consistency, overrated, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, the last topic I had, because this was actually a community topic, is do you think they should bench Faker? They're never going to replace him, but they're never going to remove him from the team. Do you think they'll have him sub out with someone else? Not this season, but like when they the, the earliest they can. Is it is he past his prime or was it just a bad tournament? I don't think he's past his prime because I'm going to be honest. I don't think there's any uh, conclusive way to say any hum any person in this sport is past their prime. It's not a long enough sport, honestly. Uh, we need mm -hmm. like a couple decades of experience of knowing what it's like to like have a a person like Faker play for a long ass time and like watch that grow because the game changes so much that it's like yo you could have the worst player ever just like be amazing because their four best champions are the four best champions of the meta like it really felt like that's what happened with drx right the meta just suit them perfectly so i feel like it's really hard to tell if a player's ever truly washed up or past their prime or you know whatever but i will say when it comes to benching people i would not be opposed to just benching the entire t1 roster for like a couple of weeks. <laughs> I love it. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, just bench their whole roster and give them like a month long vacation because they are mentally boomed. They, it is clear that no amount of practice, no amount of training, no amount of like VOD review or blah, blah, blah or whatever is going to fix their problems. Their skill is not the issue. It is their brain. And it is like how they communicate with each other and their emotions. It's, it seems like that's what's holding them back. That's what's causing them to be great up until it matters. So change it up. Give them a break. Like, it really feels like they, I mean, it's got to be some level of burnout, right? It's got to be some level of stress and overpressure. Um, so, yeah, that's my, I mean, I'm not a sports psychologist. I don't know the inner workings of their team. From a completely outside perspective, if I'm looking at that and I'm like, let's say I'm like a manager at a company, I'd be like, yeah, dude, just give that guy a break. He's like, that's like our that's like our best shot at making the most money and being the best, right? Give him a break, let him chill, throw him in when it matters, you know. Um, so yeah, give him a break for the first half of LCK season, let him learn the meta slowly with the new items, and then throw him in the second half of LCK season and have him win the playoffs and hopefully win worlds. I don't know, man. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, but uh, before we head out, we're about an hour. Let's 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 give a little talk about those new items in the new mid-season pre-season in the middle of the year patch um any fun things you've been trying out with the new items on mm. the aram any fun little things yeah you want to shout out? 
fun little things. I've been playing Belveth. I think that you could probably wow. make some fun stuff with Gwinsu on him because I think Gwinsu is like one of the most overtuned mythic passes I've ever seen. It's like six percent or five percent armor pen and six six or five one way or another armor and magic pen per legendary. Dude, the freaking items like uh, Eclipse is like four percent armor pen by itself. That's it. Or three three for Divine Sunder. Like I have no idea why Gwinsu has such an incredible. Uh, mythic passive, and then I pair it with like Bork and uh, the new Kraken, which I'm not convinced if it's good or not, but it, it seems okay if the opponent doesn't have a lot of MR. And uh, it seems pretty good, I mean, if they, they don't have a lot of MR. And so I just get a lot of unhit with Zen, and it just kind of beats the shit out of people single target. It's really funny. Uh, yep. <laughs> I don't really know if I like the item rework so far. I didn't think AD carries were the problem. Like, we saw this tournament, AD carries just literally dominated the whole game, the whole tournament. It was an AD carries game, and everything was played around them as the centerpiece, with only the Jace mid maybe being the major exception in a long series. I, I don't know why AD carries were given more options, and in my mind, a little bit more relative power. Like I, I have no idea what's going on with that. Interesting. I guess it's a solo queue thing. I think a lot of people would argue that ADCs got nerfed. Um, I, really? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people would argue that these items were... Um, a hit to their overall power level because I think one of the main things that this item rework did is you can't do Gale Force IE or Gale Force Navori in a single build, and then also the change sure. to BT makes them less tanky. So just with those two changes, that hits most of the pro builds, almost every pro build that we are seeing for ADCs. Um, I mean, yeah, those are their main items, right? Gale Force BT IE slash Navori. Um, so mm. I think that from that perspective, for pro play, it is a big nerf, and for high level ADCs. It's kind of a big nerf in that aspect. Um, other things, obviously, right? Stormraiser is overtuned as hell. Gale Force's burst damage is overtuned as hell. So what I've noticed from ADCs and just those crit builds in general is that like we're, it's kind of like a early game one shot build. Like um, Collector is also buffed mm -hmm. too. Its lethality got buffed. Um, so I don't know. That's just what I've been seeing, right? A lot of ADCs. Oh yeah. They they don't really like. I feel like if you're going for IE or Devori, it's kind of like you're kind of useless for a little bit, and then, yeah, you can scale later. But if you go this Gale Force uh, Stormraiser build, you're one-shotting people, and it's freaking 15, 20 mm. minutes in the game, and you're 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 actually relevant. And this is obviously a solo queue thing. Haven't seen any pro play right. on it, but, like, that's what I've been noticing in terms of ADC play. Um, just a lot of one-shotting, one-tapping. One quick thing, though, is if you play Vagar, you can build Stag Shiv and do, like, 700 damage. <laughs> It's really funny because it has an it has a decent AP ratio on it. So you play stack the Vagar either on Rift or on Arim. It does yep. like fourteen hundred damage to the wave and then shocks the enemies for like seven hundred. It's stupid. It's like super lich bane. I don't know why it exists. It's so funny yeah. though. It it is funny. I God, I don't know how I feel about them adding so much magic damage. Like I was playing against the Zeri, right? I think it's and a buff, dude. How do you itemize against AD carries late game if they do both? Well, okay, I think in the early game it's a buff, because how do you itemize against it? But in the late right, game, right, right, right. the flat AD scaling with crit is heavily nerfed. Um, because magic damage as a whole, right, it doesn't scale with your AD, it doesn't scale with your crit damage. So I, I think it's a nerf in terms of late game DPS. Like We're talking like four or five mm. items in terms of late game DPS. And mm, I think I we're going to get to a point where um, once all the early game... Like, Okay, let's be honest, right? Gale Force, Stormraiser, it's getting nerfed. Um, other items like that are very bursty, right? We haven't even talked about Yomus and stuff. I think that stuff's getting nerfed. So as soon as like this very high early game bursty stuff is nerfed, and you can actually play late game DPS stuff, tanks are going to come like right back. Like Cassante is still broken, Scion's still broken, right? Uh, even though I'm not, I'm not personally seeing a lot of it play in solo queue. I think we're going to get those tank picks right back as soon as the burst stuff is gone, and then we're going to notice. That these late like your Caitlyn that has like a static shiv or whatever and Stormraiser like that magic damage is going to be so irrelevant to the mega tank I think um, that's my guess that's my guess mm, I see also yeah, Kraken yeah. doesn't do true which is a big change as well yeah it, it's going to do a lot to squishies and it always will right. but I think once you get to mega tanks it is a nerf I think that the old stuff would be stronger because you just have more AD true damage mm. stuff on Kraken and just it scales better with your crit. Um, but I mean, for right now, let's, let's move away from ADCs. I wanted to talk about 
my stuff, which is, you know, junglers and mid laners. I'm playing Yomu's Ghost Blade, and that thing is broken. I mean, it's getting definitely nerfed. You start off... Oh, it's definitely getting nerfed. It's definitely getting nerfed. You start off a fight or interaction with over 30 lethality. One item. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> and then you you think about... And then you combine it with this OP as hell, like, money printing build. Um... You go first strike, you go free boots, you go futures market. Sometimes you can get treasure hunter. I mean, I'm usually going ultimate hunter, or relentless hunter, so I can just burst people more often. But you just run around with your lethality, right? Your your Yomus gives you upfront burst on top of your first strike that rewards you for upfront burst and gives you more money. So even if you don't kill the guy, which you're very likely to do, you just printed a hundred gold. You know, it's I think it's a really crazy strategy. Definitely needs some some nerfing. Like, they created the durability patch, and then they made all of these early game one-shot items. Um, with Gale Force, Storm Razor, yeah. freaking uh, Yomu's Ghost Blade, Buff Collector and stuff. So, it has been very one-shotty. Kha'Zix is running around one-shotting me over and over again. Um, but yeah, so those are some fun builds. Uh, Echoes of Helia is obviously insane. Moonstone Renewer, I don't even notice if it does anything new, but it has changed and the numbers are big on it. It has no so. combat condition, I believe, now, so you can just use it. Yeah, yeah. And then um, they added the stat, like, instead of how much bonus shielding, is how much shielding done, I think. So it actually counts, instead of you just shielding somebody, if you t the damage... If the shield takes damage, that's how it raises the number. Much better statistic. Yes, um, much more accurate. So the number looks lower, but it's not like worse or anything. No, yeah, it's sense. a good, it's a good number because there's a lot of times like revitalize. Every time you use a shield, your revitalize number goes up, but it might not have tanked any damage, so it's completely like useless. Um, so yeah, that's interesting stuff. I mean, I that was a pretty much because it doesn't seem like we're gonna be able to do an item. Uh, rundown we're a little too busy so that was our mini version of the item rundown at the end of, end of our msi episode um any final thoughts before we finish this uh this uh this this podcast um no besides i hope future tournaments adapt to some kind of format maybe make some adjustments but i think the format at the end at the final mark when we were getting all the most competitive teams was really exciting actually and we had the most views for a reason uh, ever yep i, I you just can't account for skill, though. Like, it doesn't matter. If I put toddlers in or kindergartners in to go play against major league players, it doesn't matter what format I put around them, it's going to be boring. So, unfortunately, we need to, decide, we need to level up. You have to, you have to go your lowest before you go up. So, I, I, I mean, there's still hope for the West. It's just right now we're at our lowest. Yeah, it's rough for the West. Whatever. Sucks for yep. them. Yeah, I definitely love the format. Like, I don't want it to change. I also love the fast paced of it right the main stage main bracket i think it took two weeks ish total like that's a really short tournament um for the main bracket stage so two weeks just straight marathon banger i mean i say honestly we just throw another one of these two week bangers into the into the year and we have three international tournaments and we like maybe for one of these international tournaments we just ditch the play in stage and we just get a fast two weeks, top two every team, just freaking play against each other, best of fives, no breaks, and then make our regular seasons a bit shorter, a bit spread out, so that our players aren't burnt out. But, I mean, if you can do a full international tournament in two weeks and make it hype and interesting and exciting, I don't know why we're not doing it more often. We should definitely do more often. I, I want it's four just, and three at least. Yeah, three is the minimum. I mean four two week fast tournaments with top two from every region every like what couple of months that would just be awesome to watch um yep. that would be and we could have our game. revenge we wouldn't have to sit on this for half a year and just be a sad yeah yeah exactly right i think na would definitely level up too right one of the things that's the worst part about na is we spend so much time playing in na <laughs> like exactly. that's the only, the only way we improve and we hear it every year right na teams are like yeah, we have to improve so much. We have to like figure so much stuff out. We have to learn everything in like a span of a couple of days before the tournament starts. Yeah, guys. When they Sucks. forced all the Korean teams to come to it was it LA for Overwatch League or wherever they were all sent, or maybe they were in Korea. I forget. When they all came together in one spot, the the MVP of the whole league and the winners was SO Shock and Sinatra, who's an American. And he was the MVP of the whole league. And now okay, he has his own history afterward. But my point is like it's not that NA players are worse, guys. We can definitely compete. We just need the environment. That's literally it's all we the need. Environment. It is 100% the environment. It's, you know, you can't 
You can't beat six ping in like 10 years of the best players playing against each other over and over again, exactly. right? Um, our players, I mean, clearly, I like Zen said in an interview himself, like he said that if he felt like they could practice against these like Asian teams for just a couple more weeks, like they would so be in it. Like they would just be in it, but they don't have a couple of weeks to just practice against these guys over and over again. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, there is hope. Changes are happening. LCS is rapidly evolving. The league as a whole is a scene. The game itself is rapidly evolving. I think next year that we can be hopeful that international stuff will improve and it'll bleed over into hopefully improving North American LCS scene as well. Uh, but that's going to do it for us on this episode of the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll catch you on the rift. Uh, try not to be too toxic. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Peace.